Okay. I want to start off by saying welcome everyone who's listening for from the Zoom connection or Facebook. Such a pleasure to have you join us this evening. We are welcoming the Detroit Institute of Arts for this virtual program. What a great opportunity we have here. We have Frida Giblin. She is the presenter for this evening's Behind the Scene. It's in our own voices, African-American art at the DIA presentation. Welcome to you, Frida. So glad to have you this evening. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Um, Absolutely. And for anyone who's uh, watching through Facebook or Zoom. If you have a question or comment, you can pose it at any time throughout the presentation. As I mentioned before, you can type your questions in the comment or chat section. I can respond there. Or if you'd like to ask your question yourself, you can unmute yourself. You can even turn on your camera if you'd like, and we can uh, take your question anytime throughout. But at this time, I'd like to turn it over to you, Frida. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. It's uh, called uh, In Our Own Voices, African-American Art at the DIA. And um, we hope that by the time uh, we finish tonight, you'll have learned something a little bit about uh, African-American contributions to the art community, maybe a little bit of history of uh, African-American uh, uh, history, American history, uh, and the creative processes. Um, so um, I wanted to start by saying, um, you know, the DIA was one of the first museums to have a um, curatorial department of African American art. That's the GM Center for African American art, and it was established in 2000. Um, and we are still one of the few museums that has galleries devoted to African American artists. Most African American art in other museums is. Um, in amongst uh, with other galleries. I'm gonna start uh, and, and my presentation will start with African-American artists in the 1800s and will come up to the present time. Um, we're going to start with this piece, Ellen's Isle, Loke Katrine. Uh, it was painted in 1871 by Robert Scott Duncanson. Robert Scott Duncanson um, was a self-taught artist but he was so talented that he had many um, um, sponsors who were abolitionists who uh, helped him in his career. Um, he uh, painted the scene of Ellen's Isle. Uh, and this is a scene from um, a story uh, by uh, Walter, Sir Walter Scott called The Lady of the Lake. Uh, and in it, you can see uh, his beautiful landscape. There is a group of people in this boat. You see this beautiful landscape. You see these beautiful skies. And uh, Robert Duncanson was known for his beautiful rendering of skies uh, with the sunshine. And I want you to note that there's a reflection of this sun right over here, almost as if it's leading the boat of people. Um, the uh, Lady of the Lake, uh, Scott's poem, um, is a sort of a world, uh, and Lake Lope Katrine is sort of the kind of world and place that people aspire to go to. Um, it was full of optimism, uh, it had a beautiful landscape, uh, and there was a sense of anticipation of what might lie behind. And this corresponded very well with uh, people from the South, African Americans, who might have been migrating to the North to find jobs uh, after the Civil War. Um, Robert Scott Duncanson, by the way, is one of the first or probably the first African-American painter to receive national, international acclaim for his art. Um, he went to Europe to study uh, and he visited Scotland. Uh, he visited various cities around the, uh, around the US as well. Um, a few years ago, the DIA 
actually had a uh, his gravestone sitting in the gallery where this painting is located. And this gallery contains African American art from the 1800s. And it's located behind the uh, main gallery of American art as you enter uh, through the Woodward entrance. Um, okay. Here is a picture of Robert Scott Duncanson. Uh, and uh, his grave is in uh, Michigan. And so it had previously not had a gravestone. So uh, the Detroit uh, Breakfast Club had uh, purchased one for him. And so that's why it was in this gallery for a few months before it was moved to his grave site. Another well-known African-American artist was a furniture maker, Thomas Day. He was from North Carolina. His father was a cabinet maker and taught him these skills. Thomas Day was a free uh, black man and he um, had a, a cabinet making shop in what's called the old yellow brick tavern in North Carolina. He made lots of pieces of furniture, including this sofa. And you see the S-shaped scroll on both sides of this sofa. That was his signature. So a number of his pieces of furniture had these S-facing scrolls. Uh, and this was in a style called Greek Revival. Um, as a free black man, he was free to travel, which he did. So he would often travel quite far to see his patrons because he needed to uh, show people his uh, designs. He needed to measure spots where furniture would be placed and he needed to measure doorways. So to make sure that the furniture could be moved in. Here is a banner that he made, and here is that S scroll. And here is a plaque in North Carolina uh, that shows where his shop was located. At one time, he was the fifth wealthiest man in Caswell County. Our next artist is Edmonia Lewis. Edmonia Lewis, um, was a, a woman who was a sculptor who sculpted in marble. Now, back then, and probably even today, um, people were surprised that a woman would be strong enough to carve in marble. Uh, she was only about four foot 10, so uh, she was tiny as well. But she made these beautiful pieces and these busts, I want to say, are about eight to 10 inches high. They're in the same gallery uh, that the sofa, the Thomas Day sofa, and the Robert Scott Duncanson painting uh, is shown. So what is the story behind these marble busts? Um, this is uh, Minnehaha and Hiawatha. And these come from the story of uh, Song of Hiawatha by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Minnehaha on the left is depicted in European dress. She wears pearl, pearls. Uh, Hiawatha on the right is shown in Native American attire. Um, Edmonia Lewis um, was uh, born to uh, a mother who was Chippewa and her father was African-American. Um, so uh, she went to Oberlin College in Ohio for a few years um, and she was uh, supported by her brother who uh, went out west to find gold during the gold rush and he found gold. So he was able to support her education. Unfortunately, she um, uh, saw a, a lot of um, prejudice 
uh, while at college and needed to leave. She left for Boston, uh, learned more of the sculpture uh, skills uh, while there. And while in Boston, she uh, created some busts that sold very well. Uh, and she was able to fund a trip to Rome, to Italy to study. And in Italy, there's a lot of marble for her to work on. There was a lot of marble to work on also. So um, here is Edmonia Lewis. By the way, the bust she could carry along with her as she traveled to see pat patrons and show her work. Uh, our next artist is Henry Osawa Tehanner, uh, who grew up in Pennsylvania, and he showed um, enormous uh, talent when he was quite young, and he started to attend um, school uh, the, in Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, he took art classes, and um, unfortunately, he um, was the subject of uh, some of, of racism, and so uh, he was taught privately by some of his teachers. Chief among them was Thomas Eakins, uh, who is a well-known American painter. Um, this is a biblical scene uh, called Flight into Egypt, uh, 1899. And uh, the story comes from um, the uh, book of Matthew in the Christian Bible, where King Herod uh, in Jerusalem is told that uh, a Messiah, Messiah had been born. So King Herod orders the death of all all male babies two years and under. Mary and Jesus, and uh, with Jesus on her back, and uh, her husband <clears throat> uh, go or flee into Egypt. Um, and Henry Osawa Tehanner uh, shows uh, Mary and Joseph as. Um, everyday travelers. In many other religious paintings, you might see uh, signs um, of, uh, of, a di of divinity. You might see a halo or something or bright lights. Um, and he shows them as everyday travelers. And he might have been thinking uh, that um, there are many people, including African Americans fleeing the South uh, after the Civil War to find jobs up North. And so the flight into Egypt is the story of many, many immigrants. Um, he shows this in a somewhat impressionistic style, meaning that you don't see details of the faces. You see uh, they're a little bit blurry. It's as if you glanced and then looked away. Uh, the trees also, you don't see the individual leaves or things like that. You know that it's a tree, however. Probably the donkeys are uh, rendered more carefully or closely as many as many of the other figures or more so than any of the other figures. Now, um, one of the places where Henry uh, Osawa Tanner studied was in Paris. So he was in France and he had done a painting and it won an award by the, at the Paris Salon. And thereafter, uh, once he got that medal and became well known, he, and he was the first African-American to, uh, uh, to gain that medal. And it was for a painting called The Resurrection of Lazarus. Um, afterwards, he painted only um, scenes from the Christian Bible. His father had been a uh, bishop in the African Methodist Episcopal Church uh, in Pennsylvania. And here is Henry Osawa Tanner. 
let's come into the 20th century where we see this photograph by Prentice Polk of his wife, Margaret Blanche Polk. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on some of the uh, African-American art in the early 1900s. So around um, 1917 or so, uh, there was something called the New Negro Movement. And influential uh, African-American leaders um, were urging the uh, rapidly growing African-American middle class um, to uh, present portraits, present their art um, of African-Americans, not using European styles. So I'm going to remind you that when we looked at Edmonia Lewis's busts of uh, Minnehaha and Hiawatha, you're seeing European looking faces. And this is because this is what the public purchased. Um, the uh, African-American artists were learning from uh, American and European artists. And this is what they learned. This is how they learned to depict people. Um, during the New Negro Movement, uh, we had um, people like W.E. Du Bois, who was an historian and sociologist um, and uh, a, uh, a major figure in the pursuit of social justice, and Elaine Locke, who was uh, called the father of the Harlem Re Renaissance, uh, who had put together an anthology of poetry, plays, music, called The New Negro. So they were uh, urging um, their, uh, uh, a number of the African-American artists to depict uh, African-Americans naturally uh, and then African-American social life. Um, so Prentice Polk was a very gifted photographer. And I want you to take this, a look at this photograph of Margaret Blanche Polk. Um, he lights her up in a really very favorable way. She comes over having, you know, some personality. She, she looks uh, interested. She looks alert. She looks intelligent. She looks uh, approachable. He uses lighting uh, to, show, to show her features. Um, and, um, you know, this is a very uh, beautiful picture of a beautiful woman. Um, by the way, Margaret Blanche Polk was well known amongst the uh, area where she lived. They lived um, in uh, near with Tuskegee Institute. Uh, now it's Tuskegee University. Um, is located and it's located in Alabama. So uh, Prentice Polk um, would um, photograph uh, and document uh, the lives of middle class uh, um, Black Americans. Uh, and he would also document uh, poor rural workers and sharecroppers as well. They had a number of, of children and uh, all of whom were educated. Uh, and Margaret Polk became a therapist. Uh, she ran a uh, restaurant for a while called uh, the Golden Tiger uh, Cafe. And there is Prentice Polk. This next um, uh, sculpture is a, made of clay. And it is by Augusta Savage, and it's called Gammon. So um, it's not bronze because right around 1930, uh, um, there was a depression going on. Plus, and bronze was very, very expensive. Um, this is a bust of the um, artist's 11 year old nephew, and it's called Gammon. Gammon is the French word for 
urchin, sort of like street urchin. Uh, and Augusta Savage had spent a little bit of time in, uh, in France studying. Um, in the early 1920s, um, France was the place to go to learn art. Um, previous to that, Rome was the place to go, or Italy was the place to go. And Italy was still a very important place uh, of art, but Paris was becoming, uh, it was drawing a lot of artists. Um, so what do we see here? This is probably one of the first busts done of a young African-American boy. Um, and he has that look of an 11 year old boy. Um, it's sort of a, a bit of a defiant look. Um, his, his hat is sort of like, um, it's a little bit askew. His shirt's a little rumpled. He's look as if he's, he looks as if he's saying, do you really want me to do that? And um, so it's a very charming, charming piece. One of her best known works. And here's Augusta Savage with some of her other sculptures that she has done. She was also very, uh, an important figure in uh, the Harlem Renaissance uh, because she was a teacher. Uh, she lived in New York City. She worked there, she taught there, and she became a mentor to a number of artists. Um, okay. I think, did I skip over something? Let me just make sure. Okay, okay. couple in the raccoon coat. So um, this is another photograph. Um, by a photographer who worked in New York City. He grew up in Massachusetts, um, but uh, he soon moved to New York, uh, opened up his own place. And um, he documented a lot of things that were going on in the African-American community. He documented uh, the uh, growing middle class uh, of African-Americans. And um, he, he had a number of different props. He had a number of different uh, costumes and things and uh, enjoyed putting together an interesting story in his photography. So this couple with the uh, raccoon coats um, is uh, a well-known uh, photograph of his. And um, I think what I like to see is the difference, the textures, um, you've got this shiny new car and you've got the fur really standing, uh, you know, the fur coat standing out. Um, you know, it's a happy uh, afternoon outing in a car. Um, James Vanderzee once said that he spent, he, he spent so much time and effort thinking about how he wanted his photographs to look, that he probably valued the pictures, the photographs more than the owners did. So um, he was, and he was incredibly good at what he did. He worked very hard at uh, his staging and his photography. And that's why he's uh, so well known. And here he is, James Van Der Zee. Um, this is a portrait of Roland Hayes, the first uh, well-known opera singer, African-American opera singer. And it was done by Reginald Gammon in 1983. Let me tell you a little bit about Roland Hayes, the opera singer. He was born, um, his parents were tenants or sharecroppers in a place where they were formerly enslaved. Um, and so um, Roland Hayes um, did not have much of a formal education, um, but he could sing very, very well. He learned uh, singing uh, from his father. Um, he sang at church. Uh, when he was about 12 years old, he heard a recording um, by the Italian opera singer Enrico Caruso. 
and he wanted to become an opera singer. Um, he went to Fisk uh, University, uh, even though he only had a sixth grade education. Um, but he, so he continued his studies in uh, singing, in music. Um, he sang with the Boston Symphony Orchestra a couple of times. He sang in other places such as New York, Chicago, and uh, London. He sang for the King of England. So he became very well known. Reginald Gammon, the artist, um, uh, lived in New York City for some time. And uh, there he joined a group that was formed by a fellow artist by the name of Romare Bearden. And we're going to see some works of Romare Bearden later. But during the 1980s, um, there was a movement towards, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, there was a movement towards black empowerment. There were racial tensions um, and the people who were part of a group called Spiral um, painted for a time in black and white to show uh, the racial tensions that were occurring. And here's Reginald Gammon. <clears throat> Hale Woodruff um, is the artist who uh, depicted this mural, which is at uh, Atlanta Clark University. Uh, it's called Art of the Negro, and these are artists, and he did this between 1950 and 1951. Um, mural. Why a mural? Um, well, Hale Woodruff was influenced and studied for some time under Diego Rivera, and if you've been to the Detroit Institute of Arts, you know that we have a huge room um, called Detroit Industry, which has murals by Diego Rivera. Diego Rivera, prior to that, um, had done a number of murals in Mexico, his native country, that depicted uh, the history of Mexico. And it mainly did so to uh, inform people who weren't as aware of, the, of their history. And so Hale Woodruff is uh, putting together these uh, portraits of well-known African-American leaders to inform people who are some of the major figures uh, over, the, over the centuries. So um, some of the people that you see here are, um, let's see, Langston Hughes, the poet. Uh, I believe this is W.E. Du Bois. Sojourner Truth was a uh, woman who was a former slave, and she was such a good speaker that she became, uh, a, she, she spoke, she was invited to speak across the country uh, on the cause of emancipation of, slave, of, of enslaved peoples. This gentleman here with the peanut plant is Washington Carver. And he held three patents concerning peanuts. Uh, and he was the inventor of peanut butter, uh, which was a staple um, that, uh, and he wanted to find something that could be uh, farmed uh, other than cotton uh, in the South. So, um, and I'm going to show you a picture of um, Hill Woodruff. Here's another uh, 20th century piece. Uh, this is uh, called um, John Brown's Capture. Oops, excuse me, after John Brown's Capture. Um, Jacob Lawrence is the um, artist who did 22 screen prints. Uh, and he did the screen prints of John Brown. John Brown was a white man who, before the Civil War, uh, he was a, uh, the son of a minister, and he felt that slavery was a sin against God. Um, he 
uh, gathered uh, uh, former enslaved uh, Africans and uh, he trained them in the Adirondacks in New York. Um, he, um, unfortunately, he, his methods became somewhat violent and he was captured before, uh, uh, before he uh, was able to um, take Harper's Ferry, uh, which was an armory. Um, he was planning on taking it by force. Um, he was captured. He was convicted of treason because back then uh, slavery was not illegal and he was hanged. Um, and this was after he was captured. And um, his screen prints are shown with, uh, and people describe this, his works as having sort of jagged angles. Um, there are very few colors. They're very flat. So, um, but they're very moving. They, they uh, really evoke a number of emotions. Uh, here, pictures that he did. He originally did them in a kind of paint called gouache, uh, G-O-U-A-C-H-E, which is a, um, it's an opaque paint, which in the light tends to fade. Um, so the DIA commissioned uh, that screen, uh, commissioned screen prints to be made, which are still delicate. And so right now we hang about three of them at a time uh, and we rotate them every few months. Uh, so for example, here are the people he has amassed to um, sort of take over uh, Harper's Ferry. Um, Huey Lee Smith um, stayed in Detroit for a while. Uh, he um, actually moved up north from the south during the Great Migration. Um, so the Great Migration was pretty much um, 1913 to 1946, when a number of people from the south came north to find jobs, pretty much in the industrialized cities. So um, I, his family moved to Cleveland, uh, they came to Detroit, uh, Chicago, um, uh, Philadelphia, various other places. Um, and Huey Lee Smith um, uh, taught for a while at Wayne State University. He won a prize, uh, a first place prize at the Detroit Institute of Arts for this painting, the Piper. What do we see here? During the Great Migration, families came north. Um, they tended to settle in poor places in industrialized cities. And the poorer places like this uh, would have had signs of urban blight, uh, peeling paint, um, uh, trash in the streets perhaps. Uh, here's some wires. We don't know what that really signifies. Um, and frequently you'll see in Huey Lee Smith's paintings, uh, a child. Uh, children are um, frequently shown as isolated. Um, and Sharon Patton, who wrote a book on African-American art, uh, says that the mood that uh, Huey Lee Smith creates is one of haunting loneliness and alienation. So he really depicts that well. Um, but this young man, this young boy, is playing a musical instrument. Um, and um, he seems to be doing okay. Um, children are frequently the uh, symbols of hope for the future. So we think that perhaps Huey Lee Smith is um, uh, looking maybe towards the future. 
and hoping for a better world. After winning the prize from the DIA, Huey Lee Smith said, <clears throat> I was no longer called a black artist, a Negro artist, a colored boy. When I won that prize, all of a sudden, there was no longer a racial designation. Um, okay, let's go into our next. Um, I'm not gonna go over this a whole lot. This is Boy with a Tire, also by Huey Lee Smith. Again, <clears throat> you see this sense of isolation. The boy's alone, he's playing by himself. The street seems somewhat deserted. Um, it, uh, it's, it's interesting to just look at his paintings and see what there is. So I encourage you to do that. And here is a photograph of Julie Lee Smith. Elizabeth Catlett uh, is an African-American sculptor. Um, and uh, she died recently. Um, she, um, she did a lot of sculptures of women. She was a um, part of the feminist uh, and women's rights movement. Um, and she was also a proponent of uh, black uh, uh, empowerment. And here she shows um, an African woman, the head of an African woman. Uh, and this is in clay, it's uh, painted uh, clay. And um, she shows a, um, a strong woman. Uh, it's, it's a very calm look, uh, but you feel there's a lot of strength behind it. She shows a woman with textured hair. Um, and it's somewhat reminiscent of some of the very large heads that are seen in ancient Mexico. Let me see if I have a photograph of something. So um, one of the ancient civilizations was the Olmec culture. And um, I mentioned before Diego Rivera, who had done the mural in Rivera Court at the DIA. And he was a collector of these heads. Uh, we don't know the purpose, uh, how they were used, but um, Elizabeth Catlett studied for a while with Diego Rivera and may have gotten some inspiration from, from his Olmec heads. Um, so Elizabeth Catlett mainly lived in Mexico. She was uh, married to the uh, Mexican artist Francesco Moya. And there she is. Howard Dina Pendel uh, is an artist, uh, African-American artist, who did a series of, I want to say about eight paintings called Autobiography. And the DIA has one of, this is the DIA's autobiography. Air CS560 refers to um, her home state of Pennsylvania, where uh, this CS560 was manufactured. And it's a type of uh, tear gas. And she shows us, she, um, she found uh, that she was um, allergic to certain kinds of oil paint. So she ended up um, doing some very heavy layers um, and uh, sort of went away from oil painting to collage, more collage-like type things. So she would take um, uh, quotations from the newspaper. Uh, there are a lot of stories that she looked into where people were either murdered, and this looks like a crime scene uh, with a body. There are four bodies here. Here's one, here's one, here's another, and a fourth one is up here. There are strips 
of newspaper type uh, rating, where it says beaten, killed, uh, assassinated, slave market. Um, so this is about people whose lives have been upended because something has been taken from them. They've been killed. They've been uh, they've been held. They've been uh, imprisoned. They've been beaten. Um, they've had tear gas um, uh, thrown at them. And um, so it's a an autobiography of uh, a life where um, a number of bad things are happening against what we would want to have happen. Um, she was one, uh, Howard Dana Pindell, by the way, was one of the first black curators at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Um, she got her bachelor's of fine arts from Boston University and her master's of fine arts or MFA from Yale University. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, oh, I want to mention that there are some strips, you know, the strips of paint um, are reminiscent of, uh, well, this, it's sewn canvas. It's reminiscent of the narrow strip weavings of West African women. <clears throat> and here is Howard Dina Pindell. Portrait of Christopher D. Fisher, Fourth Reich Skinhead, 1995. <clears throat> so Peter Williams <clears throat> is an artist who was interested in depicting um, what does racism look like? And here he shows what a skinhead would look like. What, what's the last thing a white supremacist would want to be depicted as? someone who is black. And here he shows this um, skinhead with four eyes. Here's an eye, one, two, three, here's another eye. Um, he is full of hatred. Uh, Christopher uh, Fisher, by the way, was a real person who at the Patriot Bar, and here's the signed for the Patriot Bar, um, got together with other skinheads and they planned to bomb the first African Methodist Episcopal Church in Los Angeles. They were thwarted in advance and he was put in jail. Um, so this is peeling away the layer. What's underneath, what's underneath um, the skin of a, a, um, a racist, a white supremacist. So that's what he's showing. This is uh, sort of like a cherub with a, with a trumpet. This could be a call to war. Um, so there are a number of things that he puts in here that might evoke, uh, you know, thoughts for the, for the viewer. And uh, here's the artist. Benny Andrews um, was, uh, oh, maybe the 10th son of a, a in a family that had been former, that had been sharecroppers. And he was the first to go to high school uh, and also to college. Um, he uh, enrolled in the military during the Korean War. And afterwards, um, he was able to use his veteran benefits to go to um, take art classes um, in Chicago. And um, where as many artists of his era were interested in um, abstract art, he liked representational art. He liked doing collages which is where you might put pieces of fabric uh, or something three-dimensional onto the painting. So it's not just a painting, uh, you might paste things on. This is a pair of jeans. And a lot of kids 
uh, zip and unzip that zipper there. Uh, you're not supposed to touch the art. You have to stay 20 inches away. But this is uh, Benny Andrews. Um, and he uses few colors. I mean, he, he does representational art. Um, and uh, he frequently talks about um, segregation. We have another piece at the DIA um, where he talks about that. Uh, but here is a photograph of him. He was a proponent of women's rights. Uh, women were not getting paid as much as men in the arts. So he was quite supportive of their uh, interests, of their movement to gain greater equality. Plus, he was interested in social justice for African Americans. Hyrie Guyton might be a name you're familiar with. If you've heard of the Heidelberg Project, um, which is uh, a number of houses that were painted. Um, so Tyree Guyton is that person. He, um, his grandfather was a house painter and uh, his mother took him to a lot of um, flea markets to um, look for secondhand uh, items. And so he uh, learned from uh, both his grandfather and his, and his mother. Uh, the caged brain is made of found objects and it represents the human brain. The rope seems to be coming out of the brain. What he's saying is, you know, kids are always interested in learning things. There, there's a sense of wonderment about them. But when we age and we get to be adults, we sort of sit back and we don't use our brains as much. We may not, we may not be as fascinated by things. And he says, don't be that way. Use your brain. Um, it wants to, you know, this is the, you know, it wants to just not just be stuck uh, in a mode. Let's stop living, you know, uh, we were just, uh, you know, watching TV all day or doing something. We want to be open to things. We want to learn. So the rope is trying to get out, uh, out of the caged brain. And there's Tyree Gay. Betty Saar is an artist uh, who, as a matter of fact, will look at the works of her daughter next. Uh, she's an African-American African artist um, who is very, very well, very well known. Um, I was at the um, Smithsonian Institutions uh, a couple of years ago, uh, more than a couple of years ago, and um, uh, a friend of mine said, you should see the African-American exhibit there. And Betty Saar had uh, a room just to herself. So uh, she's very, very prolific. Okay, what's beyond midnight? Well, what do we see here? In the center is uh, an African-American woman and it's midnight, it's dark. The, the atmosphere is dark. You can tell it's in the middle of the night. Um, she wears a turban. Um, and as it turns out, Betty Sarr is talking about women who are seers. And uh, African-Americans, um, when they came here to America, brought some of their uh, culture with them. And here she shows the influence of some of that African culture. You see some diviner sticks here. Um, there are women who um, were um, now, She's also talking about midnight, uh, not only from a seer's vantage point, but also um, amongst African Americans, um, the color of one's skin is discussed, and it is, uh, and 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 many people will say, well, uh, it is preferable to have um, lighter skin, or sometimes people. Uh, want to show um, uh, women with lighter skin 
uh, and they feel that they might be able to uh, be better accepted. But Betty saw is saying, no, this woman with the dark skin is revered because she is a seer. Um, and it refers to women who have uh, the amniotic sac uh, on their covering their heads when they are born. So there's a little bit of a veil. That veil of mystery provides them with special powers to see. Um, here are keys of knowledge. Um, there are, there are, there's a lock. Uh, there, view, there are some things that refer to um, uh, being able to uh, divine uh, uh, mysteries. This bird is uh, known from, from African uh, history as being um, uh, an animal that can fly between this world and the spirit world. So uh, it's a fascinating piece. It's something that you sort of have to look at uh, and look at the many things that might refer to uh, the special powers that this woman has. And here is Betty Sarr. Her daughter, Alison Sarr, is a sculptor. And uh, Alison Sarr did this uh, blood, sweat, and tears sculpture in 2005. Um, she did it when she was uh, uh, at the age of, um, well, her father, had, a number of things had happened. Um, her father had just died. Richard Sarr, Betty Sarr's husband, uh, was an art conservator. Um, Alison Saar was getting to be past the uh, age of uh, being able to bear children. Um, and um, so um, she shows, uh, she made this sculpture sort of based upon her own body. There's wood underneath. Uh, there are tears coming from every pore. It's a very, it's a difficult time. It was a difficult time of life for her. Um, with, uh, with her, with her uh, body showing some of the ravages of age, with her father dying. These are bronze tears, these are copper, uh, and there are nails that, um, that uh, put these pieces together. Um, the woman here stands on a, a tin ceiling tile that you might find in uh, restaurants or um, uh, bars or places where people would shop in the early 1900s. And Alison Saar likes to use this because um, she says, um, you know, they were placed in a place where many people were. So it's heard the lives of many, many people. Um, but that's the sculpture, Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Uh, and um, if I had to say in a nutshell what it's about, it would be the universality of loss. And here's Alice inside. Joyce Scott is um, known as the queen of beads. These are beads, and they're tiny beads, so they're somewhat difficult to work with. Um, she learned bead making uh, from a, a Native American from the Cree culture. What is this? Well, you see a skeleton and there's orange flames. There are orange flames. She is referring to the African celebration of death called Dios de los Muertos, where um, there is a celebration of somebody's life uh, who, has, who has passed away uh, during the preceding year. Um, she shows skeletal heads here. Um, this is a symbol here. It's an ancient Asian symbol for uh, uh, called yin yang, um, which um, 
talks about the balance of things. Uh, things are constantly shifting from one state to another. Uh, and frequently they might be opposites. So, uh, so um, yin and yang might stand for uh, male, female, uh, black and white. Um, it could be um, uh, various other forces. It, there's certain kinds of, um, uh, well, so male, it could be like a male, female, Kind of difference. Um, so it's it talks about uh, how life always changes, things always change, everything that's nothing really stays the same. Frequently, change, things will start moving to its opposite pole. Um, so uh, this is really a sort of a um, celebration of people, celebration of life. And here are two other people that you can see. Um, and in a way, Joy Scott is turning around what, what we find valuable. So a lot of times um, people might say, might value art that's a painting or a sculpture. And um, Joy Scott is saying her beadwork, which can be worn, wear this around your neck, um, that this is uh, what she finds to be valuable. So she's sort of turning around the hierarchy of art. <laughs> and there's Joyce Scott. Charles McGee uh, was a Detroit artist. And unfortunately, he just passed away about a year ago. He has a number of works here in Detroit, um, it, besides being at the DIA. Um, so there's something on the people mover. There's one uh, outside on the lawn of uh, uh, the Rackham building uh, around Warren Avenue near Woodward. This is Noah's Ark. And um, he is reminded by some of the um, uh, disruptions that took place here in Detroit back in the 1940s back in the 1960s. Um, and the uh, periods of revolution, um, he likens to um, people doing things in the, the, uh, the Bible uh, where uh, God was uh, disturbed and sent a flood uh, in the Old Testament and Noah, was instructed to make an ark and bring two of every species on board to save them because the rest of the world would be inundated with water. Um, so he did this uh, with the feeling that, um, you know, some of the things that happened in Detroit's past were um, uh, somewhat low points. Um, he, but the ark, uh, is a save, sort of like a savior, savior of humanity. And I think he wants to look ahead because of that. Um, so uh, I think we're starting to run out of time, but I'm going to point to some animals here. I had given this talk to a group of people <clears throat> last month and they said, look, here's a rat. Ooh, here is a wildebeest. Here's a sort of like a centipede, all these sort of icky creatures, but they are being saved. And so maybe Charles McGee is saying even the lowest of the creatures and the ones we would sort of, you know, sort of shirk away from are being saved or worthy of being saved. Here's Charles McGee. Um, I think we've come to about an hour. <clears throat> and so Maybe this is where I will stop. What I might do is just tell you of a couple of other exhibits that are coming up soon. Um, we currently have Robert Blackburn uh, with Modern American Printmaking, some current exhibits. We've got some really blockbusters coming up <clears throat> February of next year. 
and October of next year, Artemisia Janileshi and Van Gogh in America. So thank you very much for having me. Um, were there any questions? It's a beautiful presentation, Frida. Thank you. Lovely thank artwork. You very much. Oh, we have incredible artwork at the DIA. Um, you know, we have our own um, curator of African-American art, Valerie Mercer, and she is, um, she's talked to the docents quite often. And she's very careful to pick pieces that um, she thinks uh, young kids will like. I'm going to show you just one. Sure. That that uh, is a real uh, blockbuster with everyone. And this is by Kahindi Wiley, wow. who um, does these fabulous, fabulous paintings. And they look old fashioned. Why? Mm. Because frequently they, they are based upon a European painting. And Kahindi Wiley wants to show us that young black men can be heroes too. Oh, nice. Isn't it neat? Yes, now, it is. Kahindi Wiley, and that's a huge piece. You have to come see it. Kahindi Wiley was asked to do the portrait of President Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. And this hangs in the Smithsonian Institutes in the uh, Portrait Gallery uh, uh, Museum. So, Very good work. Love so it. We have fabulous, fabulous artwork there. We can't wait to get back into the DIA. We had a bus and a half load of people scheduled just before the pandemic hit. So as soon as we're able to reload the bus again, possibly this spring, we'll Hopefully. head out there as a group from the Novi Public Library. So it's that would be great. Wonderful yes. work. Hope to see you there. For okay. sure. Appreciate your presentation, Frida. My pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you so everyone much for having for me. For sure. Thank you, everyone, for listening in. We appreciate it very much. And keep uh, tuned in to the Nova Pu Public Library. I know a couple of people ask about um, any art classes that are in the Novi area. We, we happen to have a few classes available at the library. You can check our website, novilibrary.org, for more information on that. Thanks so much, Frida, and thanks to the DIA. My pleasure. Thank you have so much. Evening, for sure. Have a good evening. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye. Bye.